a minute ago. So we'll go ahead and get started. The College of Virgin Care Medicine Coronavirus Task Force has been repurposed and renamed the College of Virgin Care Medicine Clinical Response Task Force. The college board will continue to provide strategic oversight to the college and clinical initiatives, while the task force will serve the college by more nimbly responding to emerging and relevant clinical issues for our members. There are fewer initiatives moving, moving with greater fervor than the development, approvals, distribution, and now administration of the COVID-19 vaccines. As many of you are aware, there will be multiple vaccines, different sets of rules related to each and likely adjustments to those rules as more vaccines are administered and effects monitored. This is one of the most complex and significant community health initiatives ever undertaken. And urgent care centers, again, have the opportunity to participate in creating healthy communities. Whether you choose to be actively involved in this administration or not, knowledge of this available vaccines will be essential for every provider. As I mentioned today, we'll be focusing on the upcoming immunizations for coronavirus. The task force, as well as the College of Urgent Care Medicine and association boards have been discussing these immunizations, urgent care's place in the distribution, and how to let our, member know, our members know and what information is needed. We realize no one is the ultimate expert on these as new information becomes available daily. And honestly, I was just reading stuff as I was getting on. But rather than waiting until all is known, we need to get our members what we do know. To do this, we have been using the listserv, UC Access, and now this online meeting. Today, I'm joined by several members of our task force and industry leaders, including Roger Hicks, Robert Rojas, Max Lebo, John Cooling, and Keith LeBond. Thank you all for joining us. The format of this meeting will be different than those in the past. There'll be no formal presentation other than my brief introduction. Rather, we will be discussing what we know and the questions that remain unanswered. Let me get a drink here. So let's get started. We know that there are as many as 12, maybe as, uh, as many as 55 provincial, potential coronavirus vaccines in the process. One of them is pr approved specifically the Pfizer BioNTech and one nearly approved for Moderna. We know that there will be very rigid and regulated processes for the distribution and reporting. Each vaccine will have different requirements for storage and number of doses needed, although most of the current ones need two. We know that there will be very specific reporting requirements. We also know, much like workers' compensation, this will vary by state. Finally, we know if you want to participate but have not already started the process to be able to offer these, you need to do so immediately or risk being left out. Really important. If you haven't gotten started on this, you better get started and it's possible you've already are left out. Um, but, you know, there's going to be many waves of this. So, you know, the first wave is what we're talking about, um, the healthcare workers in the highest risk. Um, we think it's going to be many months before they can get these all done. So keep looking. So let, that being said, let's start some questions. I'm going to start off with one. And then if you want to raise your hand, Jamie will unmute you and you'll be able to ask a question. So the first question, should you or urgent care as a whole be involved in this? Rob, you want to give a comment on that from what you, you noted with uh, testing? Yeah, so so um, so thanks, Sean. I appreciate appreciate it. Um, so uh, I'm with uh, I'm the chief medical officer at Solve Health, and and through um, access to data through through our partners, aggregated and scrub data, we were able able to do an assessment <clears throat> retrospectively about the impact of um, of of testing on on the urgent care business, and it's been profound. In fact, in in November, um, you know, I, uh, folks were about twenty percent up, eighteen percent up year over year compared to, to last year. Uh, but about 64% of all those visits are COVID related. So if COVID has a life cycle, assume it's 12 months to 18 months in terms of active testing at this level, um, what are we gonna do at, you know, when, that, when that time runs around and all of a sudden the COVID business is gone? Now, you know, a, lo a lot of that business would have, would have turned into E&M e codable you know, business because a lot of these folks were sick and we would have retained some of that business. But the bottom line is, is, is if you look at the graph in the upper left there, there's kind of a false sense that just because our volumes are up, that that's a good signal. But the problem is, you know, the back, you know, 64% of those visits in November alone uh, were COVID, despite the fact that November was up year over year uh, compared to last November. 
The real concerning thing is, is when we tease out all the COVID business and we only look at the core urgent care business, so ankle sprains, cuts, bruises, the, the normal core urgent care business without COVID involved, folks that began testing early on and tested heavily, when compared to platforms that tested late, got into it three months or more late, or didn't test at all, there's an 18% difference in core business. So one out of five patients have been lost by non-testers to their competitors is another way to sort of look at this, this data. And we also see about 40, uh, $41 million in lifetime value uh, for folks that return to clinics where they were seen for the first time for a COVID test and, and are now returning for regular urgent care visits, $41 million in lifetime value uh, in November uh, alone. And then, and then the last piece of data that was interesting, we found our NPS scores drop further in non-testing platforms and drop less in testing platforms. Both platforms dropped in terms of their NPS score, but dropped in, in a bigger way among folks that weren't out there beating the community drum around being available for testing. So we think there's this concept of consumer or patient affinity to the practices that are out there uh, available for testing uh, in their communities, if that makes sense. So the question for the group is, do we think that same concept will parlay uh, if, if we get heavily into the vaccination business? Any of our other uh, panelists have some thoughts on this? Uh, Sean, I'll be happy to chime in. John Coolen here. Uh, so Rob, I think your dad is right on and I, and I know it is matter of fact, you're, you're always good with this stuff. Uh, you know, as I look at it, I'm going to take a more simplistic approach without, without that. The testing has definitely shown urgent care's necessity and, uh, part in the greater healthcare landscape. I mean, for years we've been fighting for recognition doing the testing and now doing uh, vaccinations, I think cements our place in that. You know, recognition is both good and bad. I know we're gonna be looking at legislators at some point looking to regulate us more and do stuff like that, but it's a natural evolution to have to fight those battles. But this is a part where healthcare consumers more and more see us as the go-to healthcare, you know, place professional. And I, I think that's just part of it. So we will get that loyalty. We will get a whole new generation looking at us as that as that uh, go-to place for any healthcare needs. And that's the position I feel we want to be in. So. That makes sense. Anyone else on the panel like to weigh in? Yeah, I, this is Roger, Roger Hicks. Go ahead. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, I felt from the beginning that um, that urgent care cannot sit this one out. We just can't sit out the COVID pandemic just as, um, you know, we provide a vital service to our communities. And um, I, so I, you know, promoted uh, and in my own clinic did testing early. And I feel the same way about the vaccines. This is, it's an essential service uh, for the community. Um, it's a little different in that, you know, the CVS and, uh, other pharmacies will probably get into this as they do in flu shots, but still, I think uh, this is a service that, that we should be offering. And I, I totally agree with what uh, the data that Rob was presenting. I mean, that, that resonates with me. It Listen, brings I, new people into the centers. Oh, I, I would, we came at it through a occupational medicine view since we're about 50, 50 occupational and urgent care. And we've been giving flu vaccines to our clients for many years, and they are already asking us, are we going to be giving them their COVID vaccines? So we've applied to be a, a vaccine provider, which I think uh, w you've been encouraged to do, and I would certainly do that. I don't know that it, 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 puts you, it makes you give them, but at least you'll be available to give, give the vaccines if they, if they are available to urgent care centers. Thanks, Max. Anyone else? Actually, Sean, Go ahead. I'm, go, I'm going to chime back in for a second because I think Roger brought up an important point, whether you realize it or not. And this is, uh, 
you know, this was a discussion I had last week because we've been trying to encourage uh, participation in New Jersey, at least getting applying for the program. And this is we, we've been lucky in New Jersey because the deputy commissioner of the Department of Health is a uh, is an emergency medicine guy who has done some time in urgent cares and, and gets the model. And, you know, most, a lot of us, at least in New Jersey area, are emergency medicine background. So it's been uh, it's been a good relationship. And as we weren't getting applications in or was running into some uh, a lot of questions, and I know we're going to get into reimbursement and everything else because that's the major concern. Uh, he said, John, he says, look, if we don't get urgent care is participating, we're just going to be pushing all that to the pharmacies and the pharmacies are willing to take it. And it says down the road, people are going to look to the pharmacies as their go-to place for these things instead of urgent care. And I said, you get, and he said, you guys need to be concerned about that because they are coming into your market. And he says, this is, this is a big way to do it. So the pharmacists, you know, the local pharmacists themselves at each of the CVSs and Walgreens are lamenting getting into this. The, the chains themselves yeah, at the corporate level are loving exactly you know uh, the fact that they can get into this. They don't have the manpower, but they're going to do it anyway and going to push it. I hate to say, I, I, I think to a degree, this this is our chance to stand up and you know fight that battle because the pharmacies have been chipping away at our uh, at our livelihood little by little. So just uh, just thought, and that came from you know uh, Deputy Commissioner of Department of Health. Very important thought. Jamie, do we have any uh, participants who have questions for us? Or should we go on to something else? Uh, yes, Dr. McNeely. Actually, it seems like a lot of the questions are related to reimbursement at this time. Um, seems okay. reimbursements for vaccinations are a concern. Uh, sorry, you clicked me out of the, out of the chat a minute okay. there. But if um, you want to address, we could bring up reimbursements for now. That would be great. And just discuss, you know, especially drawing the manpower for more profitable mm -hmm. testing, uh, mm -hmm. global contracts, fee for service, things like that. And then I'll continue to look okay. through. But yep, they're coming in quite well. Sure. So what we know um, is some things about reimbursement. We know a little bit about what the feds are going to do. Um, the first dose being 1694 and the second dose being 2839. A single dose, you'll get 2839. Um, I guess the suggestion is if you give the first dose that you're more likely to give the second if there's a significant amount of money involved. We know that the current one that's approved is 21 days. Later, you have to give it the next one in line is a 28 day. Um, we don't know a lot about the private pairs. We were, start, we were talking about that before we got on. Um, but it's not a lot of money. Um, it's not like we're paying for the vaccine, but there's a lot of work involved doing this and tracking it and making sure that everything uh, is the way it is. Um, panelists want to weigh in? It's definitely uh, a loss leader, I think. I mean, when you consider the labor involved and, you know, the equipment and the reporting requirements, yeah, it's a service and it's a way to uh, attract people to your urgent care so that when they do have a injury or an acute illness, they come back. But, you know, this is not going to be a big profit maker, I don't think. So, hey, John Cullen, I'm just going to chime in too. The, you got to realize with the CMS reimbursement, I know we've been talking the 1694, 2839. There is a regional variance is in that. Uh, I, New York City gets above that because of their modifier. South Jersey, where I am, gets well below that. We're down 1589 for the first dose. Uh, so just be aware of your, of your regional uh, with that. Uh, probably the biggest thing in all of us, and this is where we've been fighting and we were talking about it beforehand, is the payers have been lax to address uh, where we are on, the, on our global uh, contracts, which, you know, for us in New Jersey represent probably 70% of our contracts are global. And so far they have been silent on it. We we're talking about, you know, cause we've all reached out to them, tried to push this. Uh, and that's the, that is the great unknown at this point, it's going to have to be addressed. Uh, we in New Jersey, at least We've gone through uh, speaking to state senators and, and uh, assemblymen. We've gone to the governor's office, Department of Health, Division of Banking and Insurance. They're all aware of it. Uh, just no one's come up with a solution for us yet that we're, you know, and we're, uh, we're keep pushing on it here. And I know that's happening in other states too. But so that, that's probably the biggest concern. And I wish we had answers for everybody. 
just a quick note for everyone. We are recording this WebEx. Um, however, um, someone's saying that we've reached a limit in participants. I don't think that's true, but we're working to find that, um, make sure that's not the case. We'll, but this will be available and we'll continue to talk through the um, COVID listserv and other um, methods to get like UC access to get information to you. I apologize if you're having trouble getting on or your teams are having trouble getting on. Any other panelists want to talk about reimbursement? How about our um, people on the call? Anyone else know anything else or have heard anything else or had opportunities to talk with people about it? Sean, in before, we get, Go ahead. in before we get into that, because I see it coming up and I know um, I, I've heard this question before and you know I, I know my answer to it at least, but I, I think I'd rather find out what the rest of the panelists think. Uh, the question is, can we bill a office visit? You know, can you build a global? Can you bill, you know, a 99203 if you get a global for that or whatever in addition or as a replacement for the administration fee? And do you have the answer for that one? Uh, plus I, I have my answer. Okay. So <laughs> so that's why I'm looking. Uh, I, I'll, I'll give my answer. but And, and realistically, I believe we can. Uh, you know, it's a free vaccine. We can't, we can't balance bill any patients on it. We can't do that. Uh, to bill your global for this, for, you know, for a vaccination, um, I think it's tough. I, and I think the only way to actually make this profitable on the reimbursement they're offering is to do it as vaccination clinics, kind of mass clinics, and run people through in a very efficient fashion. Uh, if you're doing it just throughout the day, single dose and stuff, you're going to have wastage of the vaccines, you're going to have other problems going through. And it's just, it's not going to make sense, but you know, the payers will push back if we start charging uh, our regular fees to administer a vaccination. So that, that's just my take on it. I, I think it's a non-starter. Um, it doesn't help, but uh, that, that's my take on it. I'd appreciate the rest of the, the panels, what your thoughts are. When I presented the, the, the option for us to, to, apply to be a provider to, to our board of directors. I, I made the same ar argument basically that Solve made earlier was that we're probably not going to make any money giving this virus. However, not giving the virus will, or the, or the advantages of giving the virus are-, are Max, just to be clear, we're giving the vaccine, not the virus, but I know that's what you're giving you the vaccine. The, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. The, 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 when, when we applied for the, for the vaccine and when it was the community involvement aspect, but we're probably not going to market as a provider of, of the vaccine. However, to, to the general public. However, we will to our, as I mentioned before, our occupational medicine clients. And we expect to go out with a large, if, if it works out how the, the flu virus works, we'll go out with a, with a couple of, of MAs and, and our supervisor staff, and we'll just give a lot of vaccines very quickly. And we think that that will probably be uh, uh, profitable, but not, in the, the clinic itself for the reasons that John just said. So other panelists thoughts? I, I think it's important to note that this is extremely geographically variable. And I think uh, Jamie uh, did a good job and posted in the listserv, the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, latest list of all the states so there's a link to every state. You just click on your state and it'll have the latest, I think it's two days old data now, the latest update on exactly what your state's doing. I'll tell you that some of you will be very shocked at how little is in there. And some of you will be very happy that phases, phase 1A, 2, uh, 1B and 1C are all delineated and exactly how it's going to roll out is crystal clear. Uh, and then there's everything in between. So you go back to the list, sir, I believe it's the Kaiser Family Foundation and then there's a summary at the top of that. So about 30 states are following the CDC guidelines. The rest are off on their own. Now, the, 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 the variability to those guidelines is very minor. It, it, in fact, it's things like putting folks over 65 
above people with comorbid conditions and vice versa, as opposed to intermixing those and those kind of things. So there's not a lot of drastic change, but every state is different. So I would encourage you to go find your state uh, through the Kaiser Family Foundation website and figure that part out. Okay. Jamie, did we have any other questions about reimbursement? Uh, there are lots of questions. One of the questions we did get is if there is an organization that has decided not to participate in phase one, how would they go about getting their employees vaccinated? Anyone have a good answer for that? Uh, my my understanding is it's two different questions. One is um, being a, a uh, recipient of the vaccine yourself or you, for your, your staff. But the, the other is um, being one who administers the vaccine to other people, to the general public. So in other words, getting a supply of vaccine. And those are two different propositions. There's lots of hoops and, um, you know, and barrels you have to go through and jump over to get a supply of vaccine. So if, if, they, decide, again, go ahead. Mm -hmm. if go they decide not to actually participate in the distribution to patients, how would they go about getting those vaccinations for their staff? And maybe I misread it the first I, time. I, I will tell I'm... you, at least in New Jersey, it's an all or nothing. If you're if you're getting the vaccines for your staff, you are distributing to the public. It's not a oh I want to do I want A and not B. It's all or nothing for them. Right. I, I, in California, you can uh, if you decide that you don't want to get a supply of vaccine, you go to your county public health uh, department um, the, uh, to get vaccines for your staff. The county public health departments in California are prioritizing um, who gets the vaccine and in, in what order. So uh, urgent care clinics are in, you know, in tier one, phase one B. So like the second group in California, but that's different than receiving vaccine for administering to patients. Karen, what's your question also, around where you send your staff but, to go get it if you don't have it? Yes, if I'm able to unmute, thank you. That was my question. If we decide not to enter in phase 1A, how will I, you know, just thoughts about how to get my staff vaccinated? Yeah. So every state's going to have a different process. For example, Ohio has 10 distribution locations, which are all our hospitals, and they'll be providing those. Um, other locations, we do in it, um, and in the different tiers and how they're going to do that. So it is state by state. So the best thing to do is look into your state um, Department of Health to see what they're doing. Um, I think the same thing holds true. Um, you know, even though I'm part of a large healthcare system, we can only vaccinate certain groups of people in certain order. We can't um, vaccinate our, our workers who are working uh, with files and things and not with patients first before what we are given from the state is supposed to be doing for our 1As and what have you down the road. So. Um, yes, it's important to know what your state is doing. And I think each state is doing something slightly different. Um, like in, uh, Rob mentioned, it's 30 states are doing what the CDC recommends and the rest of the states are kind of on their own and doing it a little bit differently. Although it doesn't seem from what I was able to read terribly different, it's still different. So I'd be looking to my state's um, organizations to see what's happening. It, very important. Jamie, others? Yes, so a couple of people have asked, can we bill an office visit with the admin fee if the providers are providing education? I think that's something we started to talk about earlier um, that John kind of brought up. And I think the problem is, I don't think that's gonna fly. I think that, uh, you know, um, it's not, if you're not doing it for a different reason, I think you'd have to have a different reason for the visit. Um, I think it's going to be a problem, but I, that's just an opinion from Sean McNeely, not from anybody else. But um, anyone else have any other information on that that have heard from, an, from the state or the feds? Hey, Sean, here in Louisiana, both Blue Cross, Humana, and United have chimed in that they're going to follow the CMS rate and not allow the visit. Okay. It's I think that's what we're going to find across the country. Yeah, I think, I think it's being looked at as a non-physician related visit. So no E&M code. So then that answer is no. Okay. If we purchase the vaccine from a medical supplier, can we charge self-pay fee for the vaccine? 
So I don't know that that's even going to be an option along the way. At this point, the vaccine is highly regulated and and very high priority. And people are going to be, it's going to be higher regulated than narcotics in my understanding. So the likelihood of that is very low. I think that's something we could be talking about maybe in May. Um, But right now it's going to be very regulated. If someone has a connection to get vaccines uh, through a private distributor, please email me (laughs) in my personal email. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you'll be selling it on ebay tomorrow right <laughs> half the country begging half the country running the other direction so okay i think we did All have right. a question what other that, questions that got answered Go ahead, about the cost of the vaccine that yeah it is free mm-hmm. and this is what you get in the kit mm-hmm. right so there's a kit comes along with the vaccine obviously it has the needles and ways to Um, a mask and what have you, what's necessary to um, give the vaccine and information and what's necessary for people to go ahead and make sure they talk about their reactions. Um, Quickly, there's the VAERS system, which is the old vaccine administration. If something happened, you went through them. They're going to have a something, uh, for life of me, it's V something, but it's a uh, text message system. Be safe. That's what it is. Um, that's, that people are going to have to opt into, and then you're going to get a text every day for the first week, and then every week for the next few weeks, and all the way out to six months, you're going to get texts about, are you doing okay? Are you having any problems? Are you having any symptoms? This is something new for this vaccine, something that um, hopefully will be used in a positive way and uh, won't get too annoying in the sense of being uh, asked how things are going, or are you doing okay? But it'll also help us you know, get an early warning system if there's something wrong or the particular vaccine. So that'll be interesting. Anybody else have comments on the, uh, the side effects and issues that uh, ways of monitoring them? Well, I do have one comment. This is Roger Hicks. Um, as far as, you know, doing a, 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 a mass clinic, you know, vaccination clinic, like a, you know, a very efficient clinic, like Max mentioned, um, that totally makes sense. But there is also a requirement that people be observed for 15 minutes afterwards. So that, that does uh, complicate things a bit. And the reporting requirements are, are pretty, pretty strong. So it, 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 will, it will hold things up. It'll be harder than flu vaccine for sure. Oh, there have we, you know, and I know you got up there now, but that's report, the reporting requirements just on the vaccine. Uh, most states are requiring uh, downloading it or manually entering it into the uh, immunization information system. Uh, are, me- are members aware of that? And they're usually, if you're in the Vaccines for Children program, uh, you're already in that you know, vaccine information system for your state. But otherwise, we need, you know, you need to apply for that. And that can take quite a period of time, depending on the state. And they're looking to get it reported in 24 hours um, yeah. or less. Some say 72, but uh, 24 hours of giving the vaccine. So then who's got it and where it's going. Once again, this is a highly regulated vaccine. So, um, you know, where things sometimes go awry in vaccines uh, and uh, their use um, and we lose stuff. This isn't going to be one of those where a couple fall off the back of the truck, um, despite Rob's uh, suggestion that they, we could do that. Um, just kidding. Um, but definitely, uh, we're going to be keeping an eye on there. They're going to be watching how we give them, and they're going to be watching who's getting them, and uh, they're going to want to know who's giving them and when. So this is going to be a very complicated issue as well. Anyone else have thoughts about the, um, the reporting systems? Yeah, I would... Uh... As, as check with your EHR vendor. Uh, if you if you have an interface already, great. Um, if you don't, see if you can get one, uh, because the uh, number of data fields that are required to be reported there's there's many, um, and the, there is a manual reporting option, but that makes it even more labor intensive and time consuming um, than if you can do it through your EHR. This new documentation that I'm showing up on the screen right now, um, it's worth looking at. Um, there's a, it's, it's thick um, and starts to give you a sense of those, those data elements that are required um, and the quick turnaround. The, the 24 hours versus 72 hours, at least what I've seen 
in the last couple of days is in your medical record in 24 hours and then you know reported up in 72. But as you say, that's probably a moving target. But this is a really great resource. So when we send the slides out, you should definitely check this one out. Yeah, if you thought it was difficult to order the COVID test with all the fields, wait till you see what it's gonna be like given the vaccine. Um, I know that's been one of our biggest complaints is it takes us forever to order the test, but giving the vaccine is gonna be a lot more data fields. How is this going to work for 300 million people? It, they'll, pro, they'll have to change it eventually, I think. Or it'll take a decade with this much information, but who knows? Where there's a will, there's a way. Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the hill does seem steep. Um, Dr. McNeely, we have two questions kind of that are around the vaccination. Uh, should we start getting prepared to handle dry ice? And where are you keeping patients to monitor them after the vaccine? Okay, anyone on the panel thoughts about those two questions? Uh, Sean, I, you know I'm always one to shy away from questions. So uh, most of us, most of the states are not, at least in the Northeast, are not even planning making the Pfizer vaccine available to uh, urgent cares because of the handling requirements. That's the ultra cold, you know, the minus 80 plus uh, vaccine. The Moderna vaccine is the one that they are looking to ship out to urgent cares. That's a minus 25, minus 25 to minus 15 storage and uh, much easier to handle. Uh, you do, there are some things there where any refrigerator or freezer that these are stored in, even if refrigerator for the day needs a data logger on it. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with what a data logger is, that's one of those little uh, temperature monitoring devices that you can download the whole spreadsheet onto your computer and report on it. They want to see the security of the chain from leaving their, their distribution site through getting it into the person's arm. So that will, will be a thing. Some of the, uh, some of the, uh, of, uh, the vendors have put together packages uh, of data loggers and freezers that meet these needs together. So definitely check into that. But uh, it is a, uh, you know, a strict requirement on those things. But no, we will not by and large, and are there any other states, everyone in the Northeast that I've checked in with, they are not just even thinking of distributing the Pfizer vaccines to urgent cares. So. Yeah, that's, that's true in California also. There's, you don't have to worry about buying dry ice or finding your dry ice supplier. I would worry about getting a temperature uh, data logger, a data logging thermometer though, because those, um, like everything else COVID related, um, you know, now those are in back order, on back order. So, uh, and that is a requirement to be, to administer the vaccine. You have to have a data logging thermometer in your freezer and refrigerator. Anybody else have thoughts on this? Or if there's another, where are you keeping the patients to monitor after the vaccine? Don't know, workflow is related you're moving them somewhere. Again, COVID is going to make that challenging because, you know, we want to separate people. We want a mask. We want, you know, we want someone getting COVID while they're getting their vaccine because, you know, you're, you're not immune for a period of time after the vaccine. Um, so you're going to want a place where you can socially distance people, but you're going to have to be able to see them and monitor them. So that's going to be a challenge. What are, what are, what is everyone doing? Maybe somebody on the call who's done a lot of rapid testing and has people hanging around waiting for their results could mm -hmm. tell us what they did with that. That could be a nice translation. Yeah, if you wanna either raise your hand or unmute real quick and pop in with your feedback, that would be wonderful. Sean, what, what we've worked out in one of our centers, there is an adjacent lobby that we normally don't use that we're, uh, we're filing people around. So it's a one way through a hallway and then into this adjacent lobby. So they're completely separate from the you know, urgent care patients lobby. Uh, just for, you know, it, exact, your exact concerns were our concerns. We want to keep them away from the sick people, but also we need separate places for the ones coming in versus the ones that are leaving. So we can keep track of everyone. 
and we're even staging a process so that they move along in, in that lobby kind of as they're waiting their discharge of 15 minutes. How about others? What kind of plans are you looking at? It's a challenge. It's something you have to think about. You have to have that space. You've got to be able to monitor them. You got to know how long they've been there and you got to separate them. So it's a, it's a challenge and uh, we'll be facing and many of us aren't built that way. We have our waiting rooms and our, uh, and we send people out. We don't keep them very long. That's the urgent care way in and out. Um, so it'll be a challenge for many of us. Jamie, any other questions? Sure. Uh, with the reporting issues and the re lower reimbursement amounts, what would you say are the benefits of small centers hopping on the bandwagon for distributing vaccines? I think that goes back to the first point that um, if you want to be included in the team and you want to be people to be aware of you, um, the people who did testing got patients that even those that weren't testing to greater numbers. So if you don't do the testing, if you don't do the vaccine, people may start to rely on these bigger groups and they may not come back to you when uh, this is all said and done. We really don't know what the future uh, is in the next six, eight, 12 months once COVID has uh, kind of gone down, we hope. Um, and it'd be good to continue to keep your people. That's my two cents. Other thoughts? Oh, Sean, a question for the group on that. How many of us do urine drug screens? They're a lost leader. Right. Uh, we do. We do. We do a lot of them. But two th over historically over 15 years now, two thirds of our patients that we've done urine drug screens on have come back as urgent care patients. That's where we make our money. You know, the other is if we break even, we're lucky, but it's a, it's getting them in the door. So exactly to your point, we uh, we've done drug screens over these years. Most of us do occupational at those low reimbursement rates because it leads to uh, urgent care visits down the road for us. And we build our centers on our occupational health um, relationships with communities and people yeah. coming back with their family. Yeah, Anyone I, else want to comment I, on that question? Go ahead. I was just going to say a good observation that came in is if, that urgent cares are going to have a hard time monitoring those who got uh, vaccines for that 15 minutes, how and where will CVS and Walmart be able to monitor patients like that? Excellent question. It's amazing. It's amazing what they can do, though. You, you watch what they've done. They've gone to um, trailers and to, to do things like testing. They've gone to swab stations. They, they, they put a lot of money into this stuff. And they're, you know, this, isn't, this is for them as a loss leader. This is just bringing in the business and keeping people there. You know, the, even their clinics are often are loss leaders. So we're against competition who's got a lot of money that's willing to spend it on their bananas um, so people will pick up something in the back. So it's a challenge. But... Um, we need to think about it and um, figure it out. It's one of those things that, you know, urgent care has always been great at thinking on our feet and doing things as necessary. So I know we can do this. It's just a matter of sitting and thinking about it and reimagining it, stepping outside the box and coming up with something. Anyone else thoughts on that? Jamie, Sean, other questions? Can I bring up oh, a different topic uh, and just Absolutely. there? Uh, has, uh, has anyone thought or have concerns about liability issues in terms of uh, emergency planning for reactions and other stuff? And I think we're, you know, every patient I've talked to is asking me about the, uh, you know, the, the, New the England experience with the first couple of patients to anaphylactic reactions. Are we planning for this? One, have people reached out to their, their malpractice insurer, make sure everything's covered here. And two, uh, you know, it should be, but just to make sure. And then three, what are your uh, what are your standard operating procedures for dealing with this, and how are you going to uh, prep that if it's outside of your urgent care or you know running alongside the urgent care? I think it's important for people to think of, you know, are you even contacting your local EMS to have them on standby when you're running your vaccination clinics and other stuff, at least in the beginning, until we get a good feel for this. Mm -hmm. I think that Important also questions. Said, I, go ahead, Jim. Um, well, thanks, John. I, I, that also uh, speaks for screening people because both of those uh, yeah. pe uh, people in the UK were nurses and had a history of severe allergic reactions. Um, so, 
you know, I think it speaks for uh, screening for, for that and probably other things will come up as well. I think the one thing with urgent care is we do have to be prepared. I hope everyone has an emergency plan. Everyone has, you know, all of my clinics have a list of what to do in emergency. Put it, you know, right next to where the medications are in a, in a jump box that's essentially just a kit with all the medications that you would need in an emergency so we can run it and take care of it. If you don't have something like that, it's something to be thinking about. Um, hopefully you're thinking about that already before now, but if not, make sure that you don't go and vaccinate somewhere and forget to bring your emergency gear because these things do happen. Great point, John. Others thoughts on that? Uh, there was a great comment um, in through the chat box, proper screening, but also plan to utilize normal ED referral and uh, 911 processes. Mm -hmm. Also good to partner with your local hospital, your local emergency transport people, let them know what you're doing, get in a good relationship with them, make it a positive situation instead of a negative. So you're not calling them out of the blues that they may need more people on that day. Who knows if that's going to be a, a case. Um, let them be aware and make sure you're with them. Okay. Um, can you do a rapid test before giving a vaccine? This way you can order an E&M visit and get around the lack of reimbursement. I guess I, I answered with my face. I think that's another one of those, uh, um, someone will be knocking on your door at some point asking why you're doing this because you'll be the only one. Remember that the world, uh, they keep an eye on those that code low and those that code high and those that are outside the curve. Um, it's, I can't give that type of advice because that's not my background, but uh, personally it makes me concerned. Anyone else have comments? Agreed. I mean, the medical necessity would come into play, I think. I think that would be pushing it, but, but Sean, this actually came up on a call we had uh, for New Jersey last week, and I, I have not gotten a good answer from Department of Health or anyone related to, uh, of course, pregnant or nursing females should not get uh, the vaccine. So, you know, that's part of your screening process, but what if someone is insured? Do you just send them away? Can you turn them into the urgent care line and do a, do a pregnancy test on them and evaluate them that way. Will you be able to bill for that on the same day as the vaccination? You know, it may be better to bill for that and then give them the vaccination if they're negative, because at least you got, <laughs> then you got your E&M code. But I think that may be, that may be one of the few instances that is uh, probably allowable, you know, to, to route them into an urgent care or an E&M, E&M mm -hmm. visit. Any thoughts? Uh, I mean, I, that, that was my kind of thinking. That may be the, the closest gray area to actually being, being uh, realistic in terms of making them an urgent care patient. Then you have a separate diagnosable code. So, you know, it's just like anything else. You know, someone comes in for a tetanus shot and you find out they got a toe laceration. You know, you've got two different things going on. Or if they sprained their ankle, um, you've got two different things going on. You could do two things. But once you're Sure, you know, you're doing, if, if, you know, 100% of your vaccines also got an ENM code, someone will look at that. Right. Um, those, the, the computers are too good for that kind of stuff to not be caught and um, who wants to go down that road? I don't think you'll also be able to bill both on the same day. If you get an ENM code out of it, don't get greedy and try and bill all, also bill a vaccine administration code. Other questions, Jamie? Uh, for those of you close to the state planning task forces, is anyone talking yet about who will be triaging whether a person is in the eligible group to receive the vaccine? So those people that are triaging, will they be eligible to receive the vaccine? And Llewellyn, if I, yeah. I, 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 I <laughs> sorry, I think it must be a, a type, <laughs> typing concern on mine. I didn't okay. type that very well. Um, you know, when we move to 1B, that's essential workers and whomever, you know, and which is when I think urgent care will start to get more involved. Who are, you know, is, has anybody heard anything about how that eligibility is going to be defined for those individuals so they show up with the golden ticket? Or is it up to you at the provider level to assess who's eligible? Has anybody heard anything on that yet? Because we have not. Yeah. At, at least for New Jersey, because we had those discussions for our health, urgent care is being included in phase 1A because the hospitals are overwhelmed. So we're being included in the healthcare part. And the discussion there was, how do we, how do we manage that? Uh, we ourselves are using our 
uh, you know, remote scheduling program to create a separate department, allow patients to self-schedule. But from there, when the state makes the announcement to all the healthcare workers paid and unpaid that are in our catchment area, it's just the mass mailing. You know, it's, it's one of those, they will be notified in mass. And that's, uh, so it's gonna, it's basically gonna open the floodgates. But, and the discussion with them was, cause we had providers concerned about, well, we can't monitor them. We can't you know, be asking them, policing them. Uh, from at least our Department of Health, it was, look, if someone shows up and they're not supposed to be in that group, immunize them. What does it matter? They all need to be immunized eventually. We want to discourage that, but just immunize them. Don't get caught up in it. So that Don't was put it. that they, out there. <laughs> right. Oh, no, no, we wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't. But if <laughs> also, we don't want to be sending people away and getting into arguments. It's not worth a fist fight over a COVID vaccine, you know. There's only a handful of states that have, that have said that they're gonna they're gonna follow CDC guidelines on one B. They think most will up to 30 states, but no state has gone out and said this is my one B plan and this is how we're gonna manage it. So so if it seems like there's not a lot of answers on on this call, it's because there's not a lot of answers um, out there. And I think one of the obligations we have as urgent care operators is to participate in how these decisions get made, as opposed to sort of like reacting to them after they get made. And so bringing groups like this together in a consolidated way to sort of think through this is, is I think very, you know, very important. So I, my, I encourage you again to follow your state HS, uh, HHS uh, website and figure out what exactly what they're doing and stay really tight with those folks. You know, we and, and we're, we're, we're talking about reimbursement also, sorry, well, and just real quick, I think that what we'd do everyone to do also is, you know, collect as, as you're doing these 1,000, 3,000, 5,000, you know, vaccinations over, over time, I would be collecting all that patient information. The vast majority of those folks are probably going to have never been in your clinic if we go back and look at the testing data. So it's an example. It's an opportunity to re-engage them, right, through through various mechanisms and let them know that you were there for them, and you will get those patients back down down the road. I think that's a great business development strategy for all operators to consider. We do have a list on the website of all the state vaccination task force contacts and websites. So it, it's linked on here. We'll send these slides out, but it's it's on the COVID information section on the UCA website right now to help you find those folks if you're not already involved in that group. Another reason for us as urgent care operators and owners to um, be involved, get involved locally, get involved in these groups, get known, um, be there because if you're not at the table, um, you're not helping to make these decisions and they will affect us. You know, we're going we're gonna to have lines of people and we're going to have to decide and it'd be best to be part of making the rules instead of having to try to operate with them. Um, some of this we won't be able to control, but what we can control, we should try. Um, I think one of the biggest things, having been part of the Urgent Care Association for greater than 10 years now in different um, aspects, is getting involved, getting ourselves involved, getting to the table. Um, we've done a lot um, over the last five to 10 years about getting to the tables. We've got to a lot more tables than we've ever in the past. Um, and we continue to do that, but it's not just whether Llewellyn gets to the table, whether Jamie gets to the table, it's all of us getting to the smaller tables so that we build up to the larger tables. And so it's necessary to be part. It takes time, it takes energy. Sometimes you're stepping out of what's normal. I mean, I went to Washington a couple of years ago with the UCA group. It was very strange to go in and talk to a senator or a, a congressman that I'd never um, um, been part of before, but it was out of my uh, normal wheelhouse, but something that we have to do get involved with. And now is one of those opportunities, you know, don't let a great crisis go to waste. I hate to say it that way, but it is a opportunity for us to get involved and to show where we stand. Um, and I think that's exactly what, you know, as we get part of this and we give these vaccines and we're there for the people, yes, it's absolutely reasonable to get back and say, hey, we were there for you. Um, you know, if you sprain your ankle, come see me. If you've got a sinus infection, come see me. If you cut your finger, I'm here. I'm for you. Um, I'm for you when you need us, and I'm for you when you need us less. So that's a good way to kind of, um, you know, make it the bananas, make it the loss leader. Um, I think it's important. I think that's the way many of us have built the businesses. Um, so that shouldn't be new to you. Jamie, other questions? Well, and did you want to ask your other question at this time? Yeah, another question that we're getting a lot um, that I haven't heard any information on is whether are you getting any guidance from either your legal counsel or HR representative if you're in a bigger organization about mandating this 
vaccine for your staff? Anybody? So I know my organization is not mandating it at this point. Um, I think there's too many question marks there to do that. Um, but um, anyone else getting any advice or any thoughts about it? I know there's a couple webinars I've seen um, five or six um, emails today alone about mandating. Can you mandate? Will you mandate? But none of them from a bigger um, group with authority. Anyone else seeing things or hearing things? I can say what's what I've heard in California, which is that um, uh, em employers are um, making it a condition of hire um, for existing employees. Um, you know, it can, it's recommended, um, and then there's a you know if the patients refuse or I mean staff refuses, then um, then they sign a a declination. Um, but you, if it's in your employee handbook, at least here, and I bet this varies by state as well. Um, I know HR regulations in California are different than the rest of the nation. But if it's in your employee handbook, then you can make it a condition for new hires. And I know that the flu vaccine, for example, this year is mandated at my location. It was last year as well, um, much heavily mandated this year. Um, but four or five years back, we were talking to other places that were mandating and we hadn't even thought about it. So I think it's going to vary by state um, and look around to see what other people are doing in your area. Um, you know, I'd hate to be the only people mandating and have no employees. But on the other hand, um, you know, it's a good idea in a lot of ways. I know there's a lot of fear out there. I know there's a lot of concerns. There's a lot of concerns about was this too fast? Was it too furious? Um, was warp speed too fast? Um, and so, you know, there's going to be a lot of anxiety out there. So I don't have the answer, but um, those are things to think about. Sean, in, in, one, in one organization that I'm, I'm part of, uh, you know, with over 1,500 providers, 8,000 staff, uh, the results came back from a survey. Only 45% of people were willing to take the vaccine at this point. That was just done last week. Uh, we're still serving as vaccination centers and doing that and going all that, all of that, but that group is not mandating the uh, that you get it. And I think it just has potential to create a lot of ill will within your organization if you're mandating it. Uh, I, I don't think there's any good that comes of it. God forbid someone has a reaction again as a, as a mandated. Uh, I don't know. There hasn't been any release of liability uh, yet legislatively for all this. And that's something we still need to be concerned about, you know, that uh, can we mandate it? The other thing, just to think if you do mandate it across your staff and this didn't come up, uh, but it's come up in, in some of our concerns is don't, don't immunize all your staff at once. The reaction to this, the first shot isn't bad, but you have to schedule them four weeks later for their second shot. Supposedly the second shot is much more, uh, and much more immunogenic, we'll say, uh, has a, has a uh, higher reaction. So uh, to the point of achy, low-grade fever stuff for a couple of days after, after the second shot, especially. So you may have a significant portion of your staff down and out and uh, be closing sites if you one mandate or two do everything, everything at once. If you're, those your staff members are doing, you should figure a phased in approach so you can keep your centers open. CDC has some good guidance on that. Do we have a slide on that or did I just see it somewhere else today? On which, which piece of that? On um, how not to, the difference between a reaction to the vaccine and COVID itself. Um, the not. CDC in its, in its website, and I know we have a link on it here somewhere, um, does have guidance as to what the difference is. The biggest things are low grade fever and body aches are not part of it, but sore throat and some of these other things that you'll see with COVID loss of taste or smell, it's not gonna happen um, to a person who's getting the vaccine likely. Um, that's how they're differentiating it, but it's not perfect. Um, so I agree, John, it's very important not to immunize everybody at once. The, the only thing I, is, sorry, is, they have in the recommendations that if you can schedule people a day or two off after they've given, after you've given them the injection. But I think that because there's a, a huge amount of overlap between the, the post vaccination syndrome and COVID, but I think the guiding principle is that the COVID vaccine doesn't have a live virus. So you're not really getting co uh, like a mild case of COVID. You're getting 
an immune, a, a pure immune reaction, which right. would include muscle aches and fevers, but would not include cough or shortness of breath or a, even a runny nose. And, and that's, that's sort of how I'm keeping it straight in my head and for, for the providers that are when we talk about it. The only thing I wanted to add on that is I, I'm having this negative fantasy of restaurants starting to put signs in their window that say, all of our staff have been vaccinated. We're safe, come on in. So, you know, that may be a little 1984, but um, I, I would watch what's going on in your community from a marketing mm -hmm. standpoint, because if that starts happening, puts us in an interesting position. And even 95% yeah. is 5% of people will get it anyways. And so if you've got 300 million people and 5% of people catch it, that's a lot of COVID. And yeah, that, so no one's perfectly immune. And that's why uh, the recommendations are that people who have been vaccinated, healthcare providers continue to use PPE after they've been vaccinated. Um, it's not 100% mm -hmm. protection. And important to start talking to, to your people about that as well, that that's what we're going to be requiring. So they don't think that, you know, this is all over May 1st, uh, everybody's vaccinated and we go on with life. Um, unless we get to a smallpox or a polio situation where um, a case is reportable to the world, um, we need to be aware that we're still going to be trying to protect ourselves. And I think we have a, a huge task ahead of us with uh, regards to messaging around the vaccine. Um, just as we still do with messaging around wearing a mask. Um, there's mm -hmm. so many people um, that are, that have doubts about the vaccine, as John said. Um, I think that hasn't been helped by the, the confidence being shaken in the CDC and the FDA over the past uh, year. But I think, you know, things are changing. And I just think that we all need to, Think about the most effective way to message about the vaccine so that there is vaccine acceptance. Okay, so we've come essentially to the end of our hour here. I'm going to just go through the panel quickly to see if we have any extra thoughts. We'll start with you, Roger. Any closing thoughts that you wanted to throw in there before we, we go off? Well, I think that that was my closing thought. We got to really uh, <laughs> message this effectively. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, our, our, for New Jersey members, I'm going to say uh, there we do have a call tomorrow. We've been doing a call every Wednesday. Uh, please jump on. Otherwise, we've been trying to post a lot of things. UCA, you know, things are coming from the UCA, but also things are coming from the states to the uh, Naruka website. So please check there too. It, that includes one of the vendors with the uh, special pricing uh, for members in uh, on the freezers and stuff like that. Otherwise, uh, I think, and some, it may have been Roger said it or, or uh, John that said it, but uh, this is changing so rapidly. And even Department of Health is recognizing that, that it's changing on a daily basis if not more often than that basis in their recommendations. So we kind of have to roll with the punches and do this, but uh, same thing. I think it's important to be part of it and to be part of part of this healthcare spectrum that we, we are such a safety net for here. I think it's important. So thanks everyone for showing your interest tonight. Max, any final thoughts from you? Not really, other than to, to remember that things are changing and, and getting together in groups like this to exchange information is very important. It's hard for any one individual, like they say, it's like trying to drink out of a, a fire hose. So much information is coming out. And I, even though I'm on the panel, I've learned incredible amount today from the other panel members and from the audience. And I think as long as we, we need to continue to do these sort of meetings. And I think they're incredibly valuable. So that, that's my comment. Thanks. Keith, any comments from you? No, everything's fine. Those in Louisiana, the window's closing this week. So if you haven't engaged, you need to engage. And, you know, anybody needs me, just contact me. Rob? 
Yeah, thanks. I, I think I think this represents a series of inflection points for the urgent care industry to kind of really step up. And, and I think just like with testing, it's an opportunity. But I wouldn't. It's tough. It's it's um it's probably not the right thing to paint the picture of like it's now or never kind of thing because I think the bigger operators are more prepared to do this now. But as phase two and three roll around and we're doing you know mass testing. My suspicion is a lot of these requirements are going to lighten up around some of the reporting. We're going to know the adverse uh, effects are, are, you know, are, are minimal, and I think it's going to be a lot easier to get in, in back into this game. So for those of you that are hesitant now, I don't think it's all lost. I think there's going to be a time in two or three months where it's going to make a lot of sense to participate in this. So I would look at it as a, a phased opportunity to get involved in, in, uh, in, in vaccinations. Okay. So final thoughts for me, just thanks everyone for being here. Um, this is a great way and a great opportunity. I think we'll do this again in a couple of weeks. I've just, we haven't decided that, but I'm announcing it now anyways. I think we're going to need to do a get together. Um, get together on the COVID-19 listserv. It's important. It's a, a great way to share information, share whatever information you can with each other. Um, make sure that you're looking into UC access and we'll see you again soon. Remember this has been recorded. So in a few days, we'll send this out to you as well. Thanks everyone. Have a great evening. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Amy, thanks for all your hard work on this. Hey.